This video is brought to you by contributions to patreon.com slash Henry Kathman from viewers like you. Thank you. So, at the risk of sounding super cliche, I want to think a little back about last year. And I could begin with the whole adage of 2021 was a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But I do feel like something that I kind of failed to acknowledge about the past year was just how many solid animated shows came out in that time. Infinity Train, book four, even though it unceremoniously ended a really, really good show and deserves a new season, it is still a really solid piece of television. Ghost in Molly McGee, that is such a chaotically funny TV show. It's honestly a contest between that and Jellystone for which is one of the funnest comedy series that I've seen. Let's see, Kid Cosmic. Kid Cosmic is such a good show on Netflix, it has a lot of really fun characters. Uh, Craig McCracken seems to be continuing a lot of really solid work. Inside Job, I really liked Inside Job. It's great to see the Gravity Falls crew continue on and make so many great shows. Uh, New Owl House season is pretty good. I finally started watching Amphibia. Shouldn't sleep on that. Uh, oh, Craig of the Creek continues to be one of the best TV shows on Cartoon Network and people continue to sleep on it. Yeah. So anything else? Any other shows that came out in 2021 that if I didn't acknowledge them, people might be a little bit salty about it? Hmm. Oh, what the hell, you saw the thumbnail. We're talking Centaur World, baby! In Centaur World. <laughs> okay, so how do I pitch this? Okay, so for those who don't know, Centaur World is this. But it also has a. While at the same time having all these. With just a dash of. And both seasons are on Netflix right now. I feel like my description isn't selling this. So, uh. Let's talk about the story. In an unknown fantasy kingdom being ravaged by an army of minotaurs, a warhorse becomes magically separated from her rider through the use of a mysterious artifact that transports her to the titular centaur world, a Muppets meets My Little Pony-esque world populated by centaur versions of every imaginable thing. We got centaur birds, Andrew Lloyd Webber cat centaur, tree centaurs, centaur tornadoes. If you can imagine it, it's probably in Centaur World singing a song because this show is also a traditional book musical. Did I not already mention that? If it wasn't already apparent, Centaur World is a bit of a difficult show to talk about thematically, as part of the enjoyment of this series comes from seeing these anachronistic elements clashing. Between the creepy and comedic story elements, the abrupt musical numbers, to even the premise of a gritty character entering a seemingly cheerful fantasy world, Watching Centaur World feels akin to witnessing an unnatural amalgamation spring to life. These separate organisms of different structural makeups and environments being melded together as if it were a... Uh, as if it were... Some kind of magical creature, it'll come to me later. But this does bring an interesting question to the field of animation. Nowadays, cartoons, especially those marketed in America, are being strictly categorized into this dichotomy of children's and adult animation, where unless you're a light-hearted, episodic show with many colorful random elements, or a gritty, raunchy, bloody show filled with sex, drugs, or violence, it's really hard to distinctly market and distribute your show, even in our age where the abundance of streaming services should theoretically allow for more niche animations to thrive. And while we have seen a number of TV shows that have tried to push against this dichotomy, even shows that are lauded for being, quote, surprisingly dark for a kid's show, those shows still have to meet basic standards that are set for their target audiences. Though part of what makes Centaur World such a fascinating piece to examine are the ways that it questions and examines this dichotomy between adulthood and childhood, which is probably most notable between the dual settings. From a character design standpoint, 
The jagged line art, the streamlined features, and the darker color palettes stylistically evoke adult animated shows from the likes of Castlevania, Invincible, and the many, many shows that Phil Barasa has worked on. The background art shows the ravages of the war with the Minotaurs, with the barren landscapes, destroyed homes, and the perpetually crimson skies. Even from just a visual standpoint, we as the audience are meant to associate the human world with these ideas of adulthood, as it is a world that requires boldness, courage, and severity in order to survive. On the flip side, everything in Centaur World is made to initially seem as childlike and welcoming as possible, where even the most threatening elements within this world are depicted with the softened edges, big eyes, and the flexible proportions that for a while were considered the death of creativity and animation by absolute losers. Though this divide isn't just evoked visually, it can also be seen within the characters' personalities. Those from the human world are set with a weariness and independence that is both a strength and a weakness. When Horse is first brought to Centaur World, she brings a sense of courage and independence to the other centaurs, which becomes quite integral to the other characters' development. Though after spending so much time in a world that only knew hardship and struggle, spending time in Centaur World forces Horse to confront the ways that her trauma has left her emotionally stifled. And it could have been easy to stop it there and make Horse learn this lesson of being not so uptight opening herself to others and embracing that inner child. Children's animation has certainly not been a stranger to that kind of moral, but Centaur World takes a more surprisingly nuanced approach to that same theme through the Centaur characters. Initially, the Centaurs could have easily been painted as an unequivocally positive force within the story. Even at their most annoying, they are meant to evoke an innocence that acts as a force of comfort. It's notable that the centaur's magic, however frivolous and silly it may seem, is mostly used to work as a basis of convenience and support. From being able to magically conjure food, create protective force fields, to even creating tiny versions of themselves that can help with certain tasks, all which prove undoubtedly helpful throughout the show. Though, as we come to know the centaurs more, we can see how their silly personalities and powers are often a reflection of the trauma and flaws that they are trying to hide underneath the surface. Wamawink, the leader of our main centaurs, uses her powers of food and force fields to protect and care for her herd, but it can also foster a smothering attitude that often traps just as often as it protects. Glendale can use a portal in her stomach to pull out any items that might be helpful to others, but more often uses it as an avenue to steal from people as a coping mechanism for her anxiety. Zulius' flair for the dramatics allows him to support his friends whenever they need to change their appearance, but also gives way to self-obsession and perfectionism, which is best demonstrated by his ability to stop time and break the fourth wall whenever he wants to share gossip with the audience in the style of a reality TV show, leaving everyone else around him frozen and feeling pain when he eventually unfreezes them. <laughs> what the heck just happened? Every molecule in my body is on fire right now! Meanwhile, Ched is desperate to prove how helpful he can be to others, though this causes him to often brush off small details and push his way into problems. Finally, Durpleton can stretch his neck out to impossible lengths, which allows him to carry others around with ease. However, this is also reflective of the ways that he lacks insight as a result of metaphorically and literally viewing the world from such a broad perspective, missing the forest tars for the tree. Tars. I swear it sounded way better when that was just written and not spoken out loud. Despite portraying themselves as these innocent and fun-loving characters, the centaurs are just as emotionally stifled as Horse, though instead of leaning into her stoicism and apathy, they go the opposite way by leaning into their ignorance and their codependence. As someone who has ragged on elements of adult animation a number of times, what makes me appreciate Centaur World 
is how it is willing to call out the stifling elements to both child-centric and adult-centric animation. And this is not to say that such works aren't as deep or as meaningful as other forms of art, but it does mean that, especially for older audiences, you shouldn't have to use such shows as your sole source of media, as it can often lead audiences to view the world and other people in rather simplistic terms. And here is where we can take a couple of lessons from the show. Ultimately, the thing which allows Horse to mature is not the rejection of the centaur's childlike behavior. Instead, she finds herself maturing by embracing some element of their centaurness, where her willingness to express her emotions and empathize with others often manifests in her adopting the visual style of the centaurs, as well as gaining what is called backstory magic, which is the ability to jump into anyone's backstory in order to learn about them. And while this process is depicted like something akin to body horror, it shows the ways that horse adopts the best traits of both worlds, demonstrating that true maturity isn't the same as detachment or blind optimism, but rather being able to create a healthy mixture of adulthood and childhood elements. All of this is in contrast with the series' antagonist, the Nowhere King this eldritch being who resides in the space between centaur world and the human world, and is the source of the war that ravages both realms. One who demonstrates what happens when someone rejects their childlike characteristics completely. Though, in order to get to that, we'll have to get into one of the biggest spoilers for this series. So, if that's something that you care about, skip to this time code. Throughout the series, Horse and the main centaur herd are trying to amass an army in order to combat the Minotaurs and the Nowhere King, and during the final battle, they find themselves fighting alongside the general of the human army as well as the different factions within Centaur World. And as the Nowhere King's army begins to overtake everyone, Horse uses her backstory magic in order to delve into the Nowhere King's past, revealing the truth. The Nowhere King was once an elk centaur who had fallen in love with a princess from the human world, but was too ashamed of his centaur self to feel worthy of her love. To him, in order to embrace the human world and the perceived maturity that it represents, he feels that he must cut out the silly, innocent, and empathetic side that is embodied as a centaur as if the only way to appear mature and adult is by completely disconnecting with these traits that we associate with childhood. From there, the Elktar decides to use the magic from the rifts between worlds in order to separate his human side and centaur side, creating a human that would become the general, who appears to be considered the perfect ideal of what an adult should be. He's courageous, intuitive, wise, and commanding, and serves as an effective mentor to everyone who encounters him, though that was not all that was created in this separation. As it turns out, all of those childlike traits had to be put somewhere, and thus they were put into an elk, a being that would always have a special connection with the general, as it is impossible to truly cut out your past self. And this sickens him. Despite appearing to be this image of a perfect adult, the general lacks some vital elements found within the elk. His kindness, his empathy, and his openness. This absence causes the general to demonstrate some of the worst elements of adulthood. His selfishness, his greed, his willingness to lie and exploit whoever in order to get whatever he wants. While these are the types of flaws that are not inherently unique to adults, they can be found in anyone that is given some degree of power, which only becomes more prevalent as people become older. Once he knows that he cannot kill the elk without killing himself, the general resolves to lock away the elk in his castle, neglecting and abusing this child self 
in the hopes of maintaining this adult facade, causing the elk to no longer enjoy the innocence of childhood while also being denied passage into the benefits of adulthood. And it is this denial that corrupts the elk into a grotesque shell of themselves, forming a being that can never truly belong anywhere, not in the world of childhood or adulthood, becoming a king of nowhere. There is a lot that could be praised about this kind of a twist, but one of the best things about this revelation is the ways that it shows how those who are not allowed to naturally progress and develop into the world of adults can be made cruel and hateful when we disenfranchise them, be it from abuse, neglect, or any other large systemic issues that denies basic dignities to people. And while this is all quite tragic, it is important to note how the show never invites the notion that we should excuse Elktar's actions, as much as certain viewers might disagree. The fact that all of this was done without ever asking the princess's opinion or permission shows how, despite his proclamations of loving her, he never truly had her best interest in mind and was primarily focused on his own happiness over the well-being of everyone else, something that results in the deaths of countless beings and something the general is willing to do anything to perpetuate if it means that he can maintain that status quo. Out of all of his traits, Perhaps the most vile adult trait embodied by the general is his unwillingness to change, as he is fine to let both worlds perpetually suffer if it means he can stay cut off from his vulnerable self and not having to empathize with anyone. Which makes it all the more appropriate that the person who ultimately kills the Knower King is the princess, who with the help of Horse and her backstory magic, is able to rejoin the two beings into the single Elktar, forcing him to confront the atrocities that he had committed and to actually acknowledge the feelings of another person before putting an end to the lies and the greed once and for all. <sighs> now, there is much about this show that is enjoyable despite its anachronism. And something that I especially appreciate is the way that these anachronisms feed into its ultimate message. Fundamentally, the thing that saves both the centaur and human world is not the actions of a single hero. It is through the collective action of both worlds joining so that they may be able to stop this perpetual cycle of suffering. As much as this might seem like it's a simple moral about working together, the show makes good steps to acknowledge how such collective actions cannot easily occur by itself. It is only able to happen when our empathetic and optimistic sides can meet with our mature and developed sides in order to create the best versions of ourselves without hiding away our flaws. For as cynical and cruel as the adult world is, we should be able to hold on to that childlike element of ourselves so that we can know that good things are possible and actually take the steps to actually achieve it. And that is certainly a lot to say about a show that features a character called Comfortable Doug. See you at high noon. God, this show has its moments. Though, in terms of the world of animation, I hope that creators and viewers alike are able to expand their horizons of what we truly consider to be adult while still being able to give proper space for shows to grow into their true potential, no matter how silly or serious they end up being. And at the very least, perhaps animation companies like Netflix cannot stifle such creators by canceling their shows after two seasons. But until next time, thank you for watching. Best wishes. Our roots reach down, our branches rise From sky to ground, our wooden eyes Have gazed upon desires, hope, and greed But to each soul who walks this way A tree disclaimer we must say We give not what you want, but what you need For the greenery has always seen The reason and the rhyme I've had nothing but time since we've been seen. And you might believe you know your truth. The truth 
world cannot be lies And you might just be surprised by what you need What you need, la 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 la, what you need Oh, you might just be surprised by what you need What you need, la 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 la, what you need Oh, you might just be surprised by what you need.